Take it away, Jack. Good morning. I got to put this computer to not use. I don't want it to stop tethering. I find the most effective way to do a live is to like start the live and then take care of all the tech support, all your tech issues after the fact. So uh, today, <clears throat> I've got a pretty light schedule. And when I have a light schedule, I like to try to take advantage of that. So I'm up here on what's called Christmas Hill, in Victoria. You can see that's the downtown area there. So my last video last week, I was kind of where these little buildings are. And it's very, it looks, you might believe that that's smog. You might think, boy, Victoria is very smoggy. It is not, in fact, very smoggy. It is very smoky. So this morning, Bay woke up and said, like, it smells smoky. And from up here, up on Christmas Hill, I can see all the surrounding mountains are surrounded. They're wreathed in smoke. So the forest fires continue to burn. Canada continues to be on fire. And, uh, you know, we make do. We, we make our best. Damn near died hiking up here. Hey, Daniel. So the view isn't as magnificent as I would have liked to present you with for this live show today. But, hey, we, we got to work with what we get. And uh, nature does nature's thing and kind of responds to what man's doing. Nope, no seagulls, not unless they're high flying inland seagulls. Um, so this this hill, Christmas Hill, is a beautiful little, um, it's kind of like a, a respite. It's in the middle of, um, Victoria doesn't, it's not like a big city, so to speak. And so we have the downtown, which again, you can see right there. But for the most part, it's it's like communal or like more, uh, it's almost like suburbs, I guess. Not Not quite. And so Christmas Hill is kind of this big, beautiful hill in the middle of like the, the sort of southern island, which is where I live. And you can see all kinds of stuff all around, all the whole like city and all the various neighborhoods and stuff. It's a very cool spot. For you, you get nothing but smoke and like kind of a faint uh, city line. So what are you going to do? We're starting the live a little earlier today because the sun is like right there and there's I couldn't find a good spot with trees for shade. So as time goes on, my face is going to become more and more exposed and I'm going to get blasted with the, the light of God. So we're starting a little bit earlier to, uh, to take that on. And we've got some awesome topics today. I'm really stoked by um, what people provided, the generosity of the audience as always. So some of what I'm going to talk about, I'll talk about when you're working with someone who has a lack of desire to take responsibility for any of their stuff. And I'm going to talk about what's actually going on there and how to work with it, whether that's someone you're coaching or a leader you're working with. <clears throat> I'll talk about my own experience learning how to work with rigor as opposed to just um, just love. And I'm going to talk about love and rigor and how, how both of those parts are really essential to transformation. Talk about bad trips for those of you that work with plant medicines. Uh, we'll talk about gaslighting, narcissism, and imposter syndrome. We had a really good question about that. Magnetism and relationships, and staying in the conversation. And then there'll probably be some a few other benefits, or not benefits, <laughs> hopefully benefits, but a few other bonus uh, things we'll talk about. So the first thing going on in my life that I'm going to share is um, I was listening to I listened to a podcast called Sensibly Speaking, put on by a guy named Chris Sheldrake. And Sensibly Speaking is a Scientology podcast, or rather, it's it's sort of like the other side of Scientology. So once people escape from this really harmful cult that is Scientology, Chris Sheldrake's podcast is one of the a number of podcasts that sort of like helps people understand what's happened, where they're at, um, and and talks a lot about critical thinking, which is a subject really near and dear to my heart. And critical thinking is the ability to to think critically, like to, to assess what is what you're being told and to really ask questions like, does that make sense? Beyond my intuitive desire for it to make sense, does it actually rationally make sense? And so a lot of critical thought is rooted in in probably sayings you've heard, like Occam's razor. Occam's razor is like when you're when you're presented with two um hypotheses, the one that requires you to like jump through the least number of hoops is probably more likely to be accurate. That's not always the case, but as a general guideline, that's what Occam's razor says. So when you have people that are proposing like perpetual motion, a perpetual motion machine, as opposed to like Occam's razor would say, well, but perhaps the most likely hypothesis is just that we don't see where extra power is coming. And the person's like, no, 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 it's perpetual motion. You're just closed minded. And they're like, well, okay, 
but we notice in order for us to hold this as perpetual motion, we have to like say no to a bunch of fundamental laws in the universe like entropy, and we have to do this and we have to do that. So I love critical thought and I promise this is gonna come around to studying Nexium and Keith Raniere, but I, I wanna share this piece first because it speaks a little of my own journey. Growing up, I was raised with a strong mind towards critical thinking and that led me to being a cynic I, I called myself a skeptic, but in truth, I was a cynic. If you handed me something like a gift, I would say, what's the cost of this? What do you want from me? What are you trying to get out of me? And if that becomes the lens through which you receive the world and think about everything, you're never going to get a free lunch. That was something my dad often said when I was a kid. There's no such thing as a free lunch. He's very insistent on that. And I will tell you, my dad never, ever experiences getting a free lunch, ever, even when the lunch is free. He's looking for the truth and finding the blah, 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 blah. And that's okay. That's a way we can live our life. But as I started to do my own work, I started to realize, oh, when this is the only lens through which I can relate to the world, when this critical thinking is always on automatically, that becomes a problem. So that, that's a little of my own journey. The reason I got down this path is because um, Chris Sheldrake had a guest on, Mark Vicente. Vincente, I think his name is. And Mark was the guy who created What the Bleep Do We Know? Really popular documentary, arguably the most successful documentary ever made, all about quantum mechanics and what do we actually know and can we understand that this is true? And it's a pretty, it's a little woo woo for my taste, some of it, but some of it's just fascinating and is really well made. And Mark was on the show and was talking about Nexium, which was a, ultimately a sex cult but a high control group, a cult, that was created by a man named Keith Raniere. And Mark was an exquisite speaker. I really enjoyed listening to him talk about this. He had a lot of, he was very reflective. He'd clearly done a lot of work, both like prior to getting into this and then afterwards, brilliant things to say. And so it renewed my interest in Nexium. And so I've downloaded, I've been watching HBO's show, The Vow, which is all about Nexium. And for those of you that don't know, Nexium was this group that began ostensibly um, to support people to create transformation in their lives, just like this guy does, just like perhaps you do. And as time went on, things got darker and darker, and eventually it morphed into like this sex cult where women were branding, like literally branding, branding themselves with a cauterizing, cauterizing iron, or getting branded rather, were being held out as sex slaves for this person. It's like crazy. Daniel, I see your question, and so I'm going to come around to that in a sec after I share this for, first part. And so it's a fascinating story just on its face. You know, what the hell happened? How did this go? And what I find so fascinating is as I listen to it, I hear Keith, the leader, you know, in the documentary sharing about this. And, and as they start this, they're, they're showing you like, here's how it worked and here's what really worked. And I hear them using so much of the language I use, so much of the language I've been taught. So for example, they use a term like at cause. If I'm at cause, I'm the cause for what I want to create in my life. If I'm at effect, I'm at the effect of my circumstances. So a really simple example would be someone, let's say that someone has a conversation with a coach and they're like, I really, I'm, I want to do this work with you. I'm so stoked. I can tell it's going to make a difference. I want to make this happen. The only thing is I got to find out if my company will pay for me. That is what we would call at effect. They're saying that there's something they want. They're saying they're committed to it. And if I didn't say that, let's assume they did. But their commitment is at the effect of the world around them. I'm 100% committed to this, provided that. And being at cause or effect is not better or worse. It's just that one allows you to be more empowered in your life. When you are the cause of what you create in your life, when you are the cause of your experience, that is empowering because you're the one that holds all of that. You're responsible and able to make the shifts you want. So someone who's at cause and committed might say like, okay, I'm going to do this no matter what. I'm going to first check with my company because I think that might be a way to get this done. But if they're a no, then what I'm going to do is blah, 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 blah. And if that doesn't work, then what I'm going to do, that's being at cause. We tend to resist being at cause. It's easier to be at the effect. Don't have to do as much. Don't have to generate as much. And what's so fascinating watching Nexium, watching The Vow, listening to Keith Raniere is how much parallel there is to my work. And so I'm studying it and I'm studying it from a few lenses. I'm studying 
Keith Ranieri and, and Nexium, one lens I'm studying from is like, what actually worked here? You know, like we could we could say like it's all horrible and none of this should even be replicated, but that I think does a disservice to some extent because there there in fact I believe there is some of what they were teaching was good. It just became horribly distorted by this leader who was sociopathic and not whole and complete. I'm also studying it to see like where did this go off the rails so that I can do my best to get out in front of it and like. There's a few things I see. The first is that Keith Raniere occurs, and from what I've read, he occurs not whole and complete, meaning he's, he's got wires not fully connected. He lacks the ability to have empathy. He's disconnected from reality and from his basic humanity. And the other thing I can see is that for almost all of these cults, the leader ends up not getting supported in their own work. So they reach this point where they're like, I have the answers. There's no one else that can support me. I'm the sacred soul source of this teaching and this wisdom, da, 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 da. And from that place, your ego gets the best of you. You can't see your blind spot. That's inherently impossible. That's why good coaches know and are committed to working with coaches is because we recognize like, I'm going to have a blind spot. And I can do all the work in the world on my own to try to get out in front of it. And it'll never work. That's not how a blind spot works. And so I can see, like, that's one thing. It just reinforces my commitment to this stuff to really, like, um, to, to, to trust, to trust in the process, to trust in getting my own support such that I don't fall down these paths. I highly recommend this documentary to you, uh, The Vow. It's, it's absolutely fascinating and super interesting to witness, like, they do a good job of the start. They talk about like the promise of it and, and, and like the shifts that people genuinely created. And then it starts to talk about how it goes downhill. It was super interesting. Let's see what you wrote here, Daniel. You said, before we dive too deep, I wanted to pose a question. Since cannabis has been legalized, the chemicals used to manufacture and produce extract high percentage yields and doesn't make up for the medical benefits while the industry is being converted to blind acceptance. Would you agree? I'm, I have to understand i'm not sure i understand your question maybe you could can you state that a little more simply daniel just so i can get make sure i've got the gist of it i'm going to read it again since cannabis has been legalized the chemicals used to manufacture and produce it and extract high percentage yields doesn't make up for the medical benefits yeah i'm going to need you to i i, I really want to speak to that daniel but i need to get a deeper understanding of what you're actually asked like what you're stating there because i'm not i'm not totally sure i follow hey nick Hi, Trini. Trine? Trine? Trini? Trine? I don't know how to say your name. Tr Trine? You let me know. There's no accents there to help. Doing a yeah, reconnect. There we go. We've reconnected. Okay. So that's next, Sam. The other thing I'm going to talk about briefly is how to work with crystals. Are you ready for rock talk? It's rock talk. Um, this is Adam Quiney's How to Work with Crystals. So this is not like Crystal Guru 637 at Hotmail.com's version, and they're probably much wiser than mine. But sometimes, Ben and I love crystals, and surprisingly frequently when we go off into ceremony or stuff like that, people are like, hey, how do I, how do I start working with crystals? And we're like, I don't know, figure that out and tell us. So here's, here's what I've discovered, what I've found. Just detangle myself. This has been my path, and, and yours may vary. The first thing is to go look at crystals. This is a, a piece of tiger's uh, eye, not polished, which is quite cool. It still moves with the light. You can't really see. And then on the back, it's polished, which is the, that's the shape we know more, right? So go look at crystals, and then find the crystal you're drawn to, like what appeals to you aesthetically. Never mind what it means. Never mind any of that stuff. Just what are you drawn to? Personally, I, I often feel drawn to tiger's eye. And so the first step is really like what you're doing here is you're trusting your intuitive aesthetic sense. You're trusting your preference. You're trusting your natural draw towards something. And, and then once you're drawn to something, you can buy it. You can buy a piece of it. Or you can just admire it from afar. You know, it's your choice. And once you've done that, you have a couple options. One is you can learn like what, what does this particular stone, what are the qualities that it's known to sort of stand for, to, to hold, to, to kind of contain, to emanate? What does it support people with? And then you can do anything you want with that. 
that's what people have claimed. You can say that's a bunch of fucking bullshit like my dad would and throw it in the garbage. That's your choice. Or you can kind of like, okay, tiger's eye. Like tiger's eye is, I believe, a firestone. I think it's grounding and clarity. But for me, it really represents a lot of sacred masculinity. And, and so that's how I relate to the stone. When I'm wearing this and I look down or if I'm like in a conversation and I grab this and hold it, I think, ah, sacred masculinity. And what that does is it presences me to sacred masculinity. So divine masculine energy would be like grounding, presence, clarity, seeing, like rising above and seeing what there is as opposed to being in the moment and like witnessing. And finally, breath. Underneath it all, the breath. The breath of the universe and my breath. And so every time I see this stone around my neck, every time I hold it, every time I grab it, that is presence for me. And to me, that's the most important part of a crystal. That's the value that it brings us. It's less like, is it true that if you have a piece of tiger's eye around your neck, you're magically going to become more grounded and you're going to become more divine masculine? I'm sure we know many people for which that's clearly not the case. But nevertheless, what you put your attention on will grow within you. And so it's sort of like setting a reminder on your phone. You know, every time if you have a reminder on your phone every hour that says, hey, what, what did you find in your life today that was beautiful? That's going to start to encourage you and have you start to practice seeing more beauty in the world. So every time you look or feel or, or notice your crystal around your neck, it's going to presence that. It's like a, a natural alarm clock on your phone, but it's on a chain and it looks more pretty than the stupid alarm clock on your phone. And so that for me is the most powerful way to work with crystals. Other people have different ways and that's totally fine. That's just not my way. That's what I find super powerful. And what I love about that is it begins with you trusting your intuition. It begins with you going towards what you find is beautiful. And how can that be a bad thing, right? Go towards the beauty that you're present to. That's a great, a great practice. And, and then ultimately, there's like a real, I think there's a real scientific basis for what I'm describing, which is what we put our attention on grows. It's like putting sunlight towards plants. The plants that get the sunlight grow. So what we bring into the light, what we put our attention on will grow within us. And so that's all we're doing. Okay, let's fix this mustache, get it a little bit more curled and out of my mouth. Man, we are crushing it. It's not even 10 a.m. Y'all are the early birds. We've talked about Nexium. We've talked about Keith Ranieri. We've talked about crystals. I'm waiting to hear from you, Daniel. I want to hear more details on this marijuana topic because I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in that topic. I'll, say, I'll speak to what I think um, Daniel's saying, which is I think Daniel's saying like as the production of marijuana becomes legalized and then regulated and then industrialized, what happens is we're getting better and better at extracting the, the, what you would call the, um, what was it called? The alkaloid. Uh, I think that's what it's called. Not alkaline. Anyhow, it's the active ingredients in marijuana. So we're getting better and better at extracting that and getting more of the psychoactive substance. But in doing so, we're kind of, we're losing sight of the underlying benefits that might be available and the way i would i would like liken this is sort of what happened with tobacco you know for many 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 years tobacco was this sacred substance and it was consumed with a lot of ritual a lot of ceremony if you if you learn as i have from any indigenous teachings like tobacco you often put prayers into it and like and and like tobacco is a very cleansing plant and you use it to like release something that you're ready to let go of um, you might smoke it from time to time, but always with like a, a, a lot of intention behind it. And of course we're human. So part of our journey as humans is we're going to forget. We're going to forget to bring our reverence, but then we remember and so on and so forth. And that's why we create ritual to support us to remember. And so that's historically how tobacco was used and held. But as tobacco came to the West, I'm speaking of the metaphorical West, it became industrialized and all of that ritual got stripped out. And what we were left with was carton of cigs. Buy your cigs. And, and let's put more stuff in here to encourage people to buy and smoke more of this. So there's, there's what happens as we industrialize, industrialize something is that we lose reverence 
Industrialization is a process of sacrificing reverence and sacredness and, and ritual in service of efficiency and optimization. And that's a losing battle pretty much every time. I'm not saying we always want sacredness and ritual, but it's pretty hard to find examples of like places where you sacrifice ritual and stuff and in the end, we're better off. You know, I was just trying to think in this moment, like, well, what about food production? We can feed more people, which is true, but look at the harm it's causing the world. And the world's on fire and I'm surrounded by smoke. Mm, probably not for the best. And so I would say this is not explicit to uh, marijuana. This is just a function of what happens whenever we industrialize something. And we want to be really, um, well, I shouldn't say we. For me, it's taken a long time for me to learn this lesson. I, I am prone to optimization and irreverence. And because I spent so much of my life and can still fall down this path, throwing out reverence so as to like get the next hit, get the next stimulation, get the next high, you know, whatever, because that's so much been my path, I've become very sensitive to it. And so I really try to, I, I try to work my best to, um, to hold things with reverence and, and I'm not perfect. Like one of the plant medicines I work with is called Hape and Hape is, it's a, a blend uh, it was a plant medicine created by tribes in the Amazon, and it's a blend of tobacco with a number of other sacred herbs. No psychoactive herbs, uh, or at least none that are like sort of banned. So it's all you can you can work with rape here. And the way rape works is that you you it's a fine powder, and you put some in your palm, and then you 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 put it up into what's called a curipe, which is a pipe shaped like that, and you blow it up one nostril and then the other, your left nostril and your right. And it does a number of things. It cleanses us. It opens our third eye. It really helps us ground into the moment. I use it often before meditation. And I have to watch because I notice sometimes I become very irreverent in my use of it. And I'm like, oh, it's been a long week and I'm going to play some video games and maybe I'll take some, some rapé right now. That's not, that's not holding it with reverence. And so that's my humanity. And, and so none of this, I'm hoping that none of this is landing like, I'm reverent with stuff and therefore you should be my intention is more to share like the journey I think collectively that we're on which is which is kind of my own journey is a bit of a metaphor for like we we forget and we lose sight and we get focused on the optimization and that's the only way for us to find our way back to discovering reverence and and individual the way we collectively find our way there is by doing it individually hey crystal nice to see you and so the way we do it individually is we, we look in the places in our life. Like it's easy for us to point at the marijuana industry or at the food industry or the tobacco industry and be like, those fuckers. Because, you know, those fuckers, right? We're not wrong. But, but that doesn't, that's not how change happens. That's not how collective shift happens. Collective shift happens by going, where am I creating irreverence? Where am I not holding this thing with sacredness? And, and what do I need to do to start to change that for myself. And as you start to change that for yourself, other people will start to create those shifts. And as that starts to happen, it starts to go out. And then eventually people, people collectively lose interest in this industrialized product. And that's where things whole, like shift whole scale. That's, that's how that sort of works. Um, and I'm just going to read what you wrote here, Daniel. You say, you consider yourself a purist. You smoke flower like ritualistic prayers, but people who are smoking concentrates are blind to the synthetic crap that's now being used to commercialization and industrialization. Yeah, you're, 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 hey, Menel, you're not wrong about that, Daniel, and that's their, their process. And so I spent a lot of my life trying to tell other people what they were doing wrong or trying to wake other people up. And, and what I've come to discover, at least for me, is that the best way I can serve is to notice the places I'm asleep and to, to wake myself back up. And if I do that, the rest kind of takes care of itself. So that's, that's where I put my attention. And yeah, yeah, I mean, like these industrialization processes are not helpful. They're, they're generally harmful and, and so be it, so be it. Okay, all right, well, it's like 10 o'clock. So we're, now we're gonna kick off with the good shit. Crystal, this is Christmas Hill, that's downtown Victoria. Crystal's loving the island and uh, it's 
So this is one of the beautiful views up here. It's shrouded in smoke right now. It smells like a good mesquite barbecue a little bit. Mm. But it does, it's not that good to breathe in. I'm probably not meant to be up here outside. This is probably a good time for me to be in my office back home, but ah, whatever. And for reference, where is my office? My office is that way. Downtown's there behind me, and my office is that way. Okay. So let's start into some of these juicy topics. Love you, Daniel. Thank you for your suggestion, your question. If y'all have any questions in this moment for us to talk about on this show, let us know. Put them in the comments. I want to hear them. For now, David says, Adam, can you speak on experiences leading CEOs, teams, or with personal family friends? Specifically, I'm curious if you've ever experienced someone quite deceived, very like feeling the victim, not wanting or capable of taking responsibility. They're not seeing their part. They're very entrenched in how they feel misunderstood and their position, and it's all the world's fault. How do you navigate that? How do we work with that? So I think the best place to start with this is to recognize everyone feels this way. Everyone is this way. And the more someone like the more someone is touting like, ah, I I used to be asleep, but now I'm awake and I want other people to be awake, the more likely that person is quite asleep. Because part of waking up is recognizing how often you are asleep and and coming to an acceptance of that. And so we the first thing we have to do is sort of like recognize this person isn't unique or special or particular. Their their asleepness is not bad or wrong. And and in order for us to really start to work with them, we have to be able to see ourselves in them. Meaning we have to be able to see the places where we're asleep. Meaning we gotta work with our own coach. That's why we work with our own coach. So someone quite deceived, they feel like a victim and they're not wanting or capable to take responsibility. So often in leadership and coaching, what happens in situations like this is that the coach or the leader is a bit triggered by how the client's showing up. The client is very victimized. They're very at the effect of stuff. They're very insistent that it's not their problem, blah, 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 blah. And that triggers the coach or the leader because the coach or the leader is like, people should be responsible. This is not a good way to live. I would never be willing to be a victim. And people that tend towards coaching and leadership tend to have a hard time accepting their own victimhood, this guy included, especially this guy, number one. And so from that, that judgment about being a victimhood, we don't have much capacity to get the person. Instead, what we want to do is like hammer them in the head, hammer them in the head right there and get them to change their state, change the way they're being. And so that's not going to work. Because what we're doing is fundamentally like we're, we're not getting that person. We're not giving them the experience of being gotten. We're not giving them the experience of being seen. We're giving them the experience that how they're showing up is not enough. We're giving them the experience that they're wrong for the way they're showing up. And, and what that does to people is it has them entrenched further. So the first thing we have to do in situations like this when someone's really unwilling is we have to recognize their unwillingness is a function of how I'm showing up. That's a really powerful stand to take when we're coaching and leading. It's like anytime we hear ourselves say the word uncoachable, what we actually got to do is say, how am I showing up that has this person showing up uncoachable? Who am I being? What's the clearing I'm currently creating? I think there's a sneeze coming. Let's find out. Not yet. It's just going to tease me. It's going to hang out back there. I wonder if that's like a thing they do in, in torture camps. It's like they tickle your nose, but then don't let you sneeze. That'd be horrible. So back to our question, how am I being that's having this person show up as uncoachable? Is it the way I'm relating to them? Is it the way that I'm holding them? Is it the way I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about how they're showing up? Is it my judgments in the space? Is it the sort of questions I'm asking because they're not feeling gotten? Because uncoachable is ultimately someone's just closed. And... It's possible to support people to open. That's, that's our job. What does this person need in this moment to open? So often, when someone is starting like very caught in the victimhood and very stuck, what I do is I really get them. I say, tell me more. And they, they explain, well, this person's doing this and, and like this fucker's doing this thing to me and it's, it's not my fault. I didn't do anything at all wrong. And I go, okay, can, can you elaborate? I really want to understand. And my job as I'm listening to them is to completely understand how what they're sharing makes 100% sense. 
not makes 100% sense from the perspective of like, well, you're broken in the brain and you have brain parasites, so it makes sense that you think this way. Not that kind of making sense. Like makes sense truly. I have a friend, a random Facebook friend, who's this older Christian guy, and he's he's very lovely, and I enjoy our conversations, and it's fun to explore spirituality with someone of a different belief than mine. But inherent in his belief, he has a context, and his context is, if only Adam knew what I knew, he would see things differently. I don't hold that context for him. And from his context, he'll say things like, ah, that makes a lot of sense that you, that you feel that way because you can only know what you know. Or, ah, I can see how from where you are, it would make sense that that's how you would see it. So there's an inherent condescension in that, right? There's an inherent like, like patronizing, you know, oh, it's okay. You see it that way, but don't worry. Once you're my age, you will feel blah, blah, blah. And that tends to be the way that we try to let people feel gotten. That's not what we're talking about here. That's just going to have the person feel manipulated and then it's going to have them entrench further in their belief. So I really want to like set aside everything I think I know about how the world works and how people are and what works in leadership and all that. Throw it out. And then I want to sit and be like, okay, I'm really curious. Can you tell me more? Help me understand. Okay, that, that. You did nothing at all. Okay, okay. That's unusual for me. People often do stuff. Like, can you help me understand that? Okay, got it. That makes sense. And I'm tr what I'm trying to do, what I'm seeking to do is get myself to a place where I really agree. Because only then can they let go of this thing they're holding on to. When we have like stuff like this showing up, we tend to wrap around it like a ball. Like we're very protective of it. And the more someone tries to move us off of it or take it away from us, the more we clench. Whereas once someone really gives us the beautiful experience of being gotten, lets us know, that like, hey, it's okay. I'm not trying to shift you. I just want to understand and really sits with us in it. Then we can kind of like relax it a little bit. So that's the first step that we have to do. We have to relax it. And then usually the second thing that I do in this situation is I'll say something like, okay, so I hear you talking a lot about how things are. Is that how you want them to be? And then usually what people will do at that point is they'll go back to telling me how things are. They'll be like, well, no, I don't want them this way, but here's why they have to be that way and blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. And, and I'll listen for longer and then I'll stop them again and I'll be like, okay, got it. So like I noticed you started to talk a little bit about what you wanted, but then you went back to the way things have to be. So I'm just curious if like we had the architectural blueprints out and we were looking down and we were like, how do you want this to look? Is this what you would choose? Well, no, definitely not. Okay, what would you choose? And all I'm trying to do at this instance is get clear on like, what's the possibility they want to make happen in their life, lives, their lives, their life, whatever it is, whatever that word is, singular, plural. And from there, we can start to broaden the conversation. So that is the shift where we're starting to move away from life as it is to life as it could be to the life they want. And from there, you can start to help people move out. Like what's the gap and start to explore that further. But what most people try to do is someone's describing the way their life is, and then they're trying to like coach them or lead them out of that. This person hasn't even told them what they actually want. They're just trying to get, they're trying to like move them out of it because the coach has an agenda because the coach doesn't like this victimhood because the coach has no capacity to be with their own victimhood. So the more we can like let people just be where they are and really accept them there and like do our hard work to understand how that makes sense, the more they can start to release that and then things can become so, so much easier because we're not trying to make them go anywhere. We're just getting curious about the world as it is for them. And then we're getting curious about what they want to create if it didn't have to be like that. And then we're starting to bring curiosity to like, okay, what would need to shift? And once we're in that conversation, once we have a thing to move towards, it becomes a lot easier to support people to see the sort of stuff, David, that you're talking about, like unwilling to take responsibility for anything. You know, from there, I might start to be like, okay, so you said... You want to deep, trust people more deeply. Yeah, but I can't because they'll betray me. Well, now we can, now we can go somewhere, right? Because like, okay, well, what do you think the cost of trusting someone is? Well, I don't know, like whatever. Yeah, okay, but what? Like if you trust someone, what does that put you at risk for? Well, I don't know, they might like betray me. Okay, great. Let's explore that. Then we can start to unpack a lot of this stuff. But that only comes to fruition once we've 
like once we've got somewhere that the person wants to go. Until there's a direction they want to go in, any attempts to move them is our agenda. Hey, Randy, happy Friday. From Christmas Hill. Uh, I don't think David has anything more there. So Seth asks, um, he says, I'm curious about the quote unquote rigor, he puts in quotes, rigor, that you learned while working with Werner Earhart. So some background, Werner Earhart is the man that founded Landmark Forums. Before that, he created something called Earhart Seminars Training, EST. So EST, then Landmark Forum. And then he created the Being a Leader course, which is an awesome course. And then, um, and then after that, he, uh, well, now I think he's mostly like resting because he's, he's pretty old. Randy, thank you so much for that uh, testimonial. I really appreciate that. Um, so EST, when it was initially founded, and Landmark Forum in the early days were very, very rigorous, meaning they would close the doors and they would say, okay, you're not allowed to go to the bathroom until our break. Deal with it. And the intention behind this was that people do all kinds of things to escape confrontation. So once I start to feel confronted by the situation or the conversation you're bringing to me, I'm going to find a way to exit. This is often what happens where at the end of a, a conversation, someone's like, okay, well, let me think about it. They're trying to like get out of the awkwardness, the confrontation they feel in this moment. Let me think about it. And then they can like go away and they don't have to be in the, in the heat of that moment. So the idea around Werner's work at that time was sort of like, people are going to try to escape and we're going to not let them do that. We're going to force them to confront this thing. Now, these days we'd say that that's a bit draconian. And we'd say probably like abusive. You know, you can't, you can't do that. You got to let people go to the bathroom. And there's more artful ways to hold their feet to the fire than just saying you can't go to the bathroom. Like when someone says, hey, I need to go to the bathroom, we could say, okay, got it. No problem. They go. And then 30 minutes later, they're like, I need to go to the bathroom. We can say, hey, we notice that there's a tendency you have to keep getting up and leaving and going to the bathroom. And it, we notice that it's happening as a conversation starts to pick up heat. Do you notice that? And then we can start to work with them in there. So Werner, very rigorous. Let's take a moment to talk about rigor and its place in leadership and coaching. Transformation, transformational coaching, transformational leadership, breakthrough work requires two sort of fundamental polaric ingredients. The first is love and the second is rigor. So rigor is like me holding your feet to the fire. It's you not doing something and me bringing that conversation to you instead of just saying, ah, fuck it. They didn't do it. I don't care. It's not my job to like manage that for them. That would be a lack of rigor. Rigor is where like there's a consequence. There's an accountability. All of that is rigor. It, it holds our feet to the fire. Rigor, absent any love, is brutality. If I'm just hammering on you, but I'm not doing it with any love, that doesn't feel good. And what you're going to do, like you might force yourself down the, the race course. You might do that because you're like, feels horrible when Adam, Adam's hammering on me, but there's not going to be any transformation. You're just going to do what I'm telling you to do or what you're saying you're going to do because you want to outrace this tyrant over here, whether the tyrant is me or the voice inside your own head. So that's rigor without love. Love is the ingredient where we hold ourselves with grace and we are held with grace. Love is the ingredient where you didn't do that thing. And I really like invite you to like, let yourself have permission for that and to like, let yourself off the hook. Hey, it's okay. You didn't do the thing. It's okay. It doesn't mean you're a shitty human being. It doesn't mean all the stories you're telling yourself about that. It's okay that you didn't score that goal in soccer today. It doesn't mean anything. It just doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's okay. That's love. Love absent rigor is toothless. So you can see this in a lot of like, um, kind of tantric or yogic or like cuddle kind of communities where there's like a lot of talk about the promise of what could be. And that's what it remains. It remains talk because there's no rigor to like hold us accountable to go forward. And what tends to happen is we bifurcate into one of these two extremes. So most leadership circles like corporate executive, Silicon Valley, that kind of stuff tends to be mostly rigor. And then the other side is sort of like a reaction to that. Fuck that. That sucked. That felt horrible. I'm only going to operate out of love. 
And so then you have these other places where it's like the promise is good and it feels so good to just be understood by other people, but nothing really ever happens beyond what was already predictably going to happen. So this is, now I've got to talk about predictable. Rigor and love cause transformation and transformation causes results that you weren't already going to be reliable to create. Hey, Jane, that doesn't mean you won't create stuff. Like if I live my life with love and no rigor, I'll still possibly write that book. I'll still possibly drive downtown and spend time with my friends. I'll still possibly go back to school and get another degree. It doesn't mean stuff's not going to happen. But all of that stuff is already within the sphere of what I was predictably going to be able to create. Transformation is everything outside of that. And so that's where love and rigor are required together. So it's important here that we not, like sometimes people defend, well, you don't understand, Adam. My group, we're all love. We don't have any rigor and we make stuff happen. Totally. I'm sure you do. But what's happening is what's predictable. It's what's already available. Not yet created, but already available. Love and rigor are required to create that which is beyond that. So now that I've laid that all out, I can come to Werner. And I would say before getting to Werner, I learned a lot about rigor through my work with accomplishment coaching, which was kind of used, borrowed from a fair degree, Werner Earhart's work. And so in that school, I learned about how to hold feet to the fire. I learned about how to, um, to support people to become more accountable to themselves, not to me, to themselves. And the way we become more accountable to ourselves is that we, we look and we account for what happened. Hey, I said I was going to do this and I didn't. And I want to move the conversation past this point, but actually I'm going to sit here and look at it because that's how I become accountable to myself. That's rigor. So I learned a lot about that there. From going to Seth's like question, you know, what did you get from Werner? What I got from Werner was in that line of work, they're very rigorous about their use of language. And I'm just going to see if I can bring up on my lappy toppy here right quick. Uh, being a leader, I want to, I'm going to read you the definition of leadership that they have here. Just to give you an example of like the kind of rigor definition, um, definition leadership. Now this might be a fool's errand because this is a, a, a long set of slides. So I'm going to read you a little bit here just so you can get a sense. And Werner's work is heavily focused on language because the belief there is with language, we can get our hands around the nuts and bolts of stuff. We can get specific to the, to the atom that we want to work with. And if we can do that, then we have power. Then we can work with it. So, <laughs> so funny. Let me just, uh, here it is. Uh, da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Okay, so they've got four aspects of the contextual framework. I can't, uh, Seth, I'm sorry. You can look up being a leader slide deck. I'm, I'm out in the woods, so <laughs> you've got to do that work for you. But if you look up being a leader slide deck, you'll see that 600 slides or so that make up the being a leader course and they are dense and so the four aspects of the contextual framework for leader and leadership that's already pretty dense right linguistic abstractions phenomena domains terms now we look at each of these in detail and i'm just going to read you the definition of a linguistic abstraction so the first of this slide they say what is a linguistic abstraction what we mean by linguistic abstraction is based on dictionary definitions of these two words, an abstract entity that is created in language and generates a realm of possibility that is separate and distinct from, which is to say, exists apart from actual instances of examples of itself and apart from concepts and definitions of itself. Now, many of you have already gone cross-eyed as I'm reading that, but I'm just going to read a little bit more. And they say, leadership per se as a linguistic abstraction creates a new possibility. Uh, and then is there any more I want to read to you? I think I've done, I've gone far enough. So that, that gives you an example of like 
the extent to which that work is committed to like zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in. And like, that's the piece. Okay. We've defined it. And then we have to define the stuff around it and then around it further. And now we can zoom out and start to support you to work with that. And so what I learned was a couple things. One, how precise we can get with our language. And I learned that, you know, like, as I read that, some of you might be like, fuck that. You know, that's nuts. Who's going to pay attention to that? That's, I mean, nerds like Adam, probably, who love leadership, but I'm not going to do that. And what was fascinating in that room was that they started by saying, there's 150 people here who are Russian. There's a lot of Russians. They're very, they really love, um, at least at the time, they really loved Werner Earhart's work. 150 people are Russian, and they're being, all of this is being translated. Second, um, the way this work, the way we deliver this teaching is that you have your slides in front of you and we are going to put the slides up one by one on the screen and someone who is our designated slide reader is going to read the slides out loud. And if you get lost, you are going to put up your hand and we're going to make sure that we clear up any, any confusion before we go forward. I was like, that's crazy. How can this possibly work? And what I discovered was that it did. And the shift for me was that they had a context that anyone can understand this, whereas my context was only really brilliant people will be able to work with this kind of languaging. We're going to lose everyone who doesn't have brilliance. And they're like, everyone has the capacity to do this. And so from that context, that's what they created. So 150 people who, who didn't even speak a word of English were able to follow along. They had a translator, but still, they couldn't even follow with the slides. I still got it. So I learned that. And then the second thing I learned from like being in a container that focused that heavily on, on language and stuff was that you can become incredibly heady with this stuff. And there was a lot of people that there who were steeped in Landmark. They'd been leaders of Landmark's work. They were coming here to work with Werner Earhart now. And what I found, and you might find this too with people that are deep in Landmark, is that they were not particularly embodied. They could talk a lot about these distinctions around, around leadership and ontology and stuff, but like, it was a little bit like talking to a robot. And I was kind of like, like one person was saying, you know, I wasn't going to go out for dinner and cause I had a headache. And then I realized the headache's just a conversation. And so I went out for dinner and on the one hand I was like, that's cool. You like chose a different reality for yourself. And then the other part of me was like, yeah, and sometimes a headache's just a headache. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that either. Sometimes your head just hurts and, and you don't actually want to go out for dinner. And whatever they choose, like as long as it's empowering for them, amazing. But that was sort of an example for me of one of those places where you can become incredibly locked in your brain with this stuff. Seth, what you want to Google for is being a leader. Being a leader slide deck. Being a leader at slide deck and, and it's all downloadable. The whole slide deck is downloadable and you can go through every slide by slide. A lot of people do this. Some people who can't make their way to Cancun where the course is taught, they, um, they set up groups and then they go through the slides each week and like work with it. The, the structure of their work was really interesting. So sitting there reading the slides, which I found super, I was, I'm such a nerd for this stuff. And then we'd have breaks where we would like, put into, there's wasps around me, be gone wasp. We'd put into action what we'd learned or we would work through exercises and then we'd come back and we'd share what we got and then we would sit back down or we'd have lunch and then we'd come back and we'd sit back down and then we'd have homework and then we had a two day break in between where we had some homework and so on and so forth. So it was a really interesting um, process and I'm super glad I did it. And a lot of people there were like, I'm coming back. This is so valuable. And I was like, this is amazing and I'm super glad I came and I'm not going to do this again. This is just not where my work continues. These are not the teachers for me. And I guess one thing I notice is these days I work with a lot of teachers that I would that are shaman. You know, they're deep in their work with the medicine, they're deep in their work with like spirituality. And what I notice is they're all very adept with language, but there is no, sh like, they don't need this level of rigorous definition of these sort of things. And they are incredibly powerful. 
and they are able to affect transformation incredibly effectively without needing that. And so I kind of hold like that's one vector. We can work with the power of language. And, and in my coaching, I use language a lot. That's how I work with my people. But it's not a, necessi it's not a necessity. It's not a requirement. There's many ways we can affect transformation. OK, let's talk about bad trips. So Faison, what's up, Faison? Says, talk about the idea of no such thing as a bad trip and how to distinguish genuine harm from spiritual growth. So it's two different questions. So bad trips are typically associated with LSD or mushrooms, psilocybin. And a bad trip typically is where you've taken some element of the drug and you start to have an experience that you don't want to have. And you're like, I don't want to have this. And yet the experience persists. And that starts to cascade. So you start to get scared, and then that your fear builds on itself, and then you're scared more, and then you're more scared, and then you're more scared, and then boom, you know, you're just like, ah, this is horrible. How do I make it stop? How do I make it stop? So I would assert that a bad trip is a Western idea. That in indigenous contexts, they don't have the notion of a bad trip. Just like hallucination is a Western concept. In spiritual practice and in indigenous cultures, they have visions. Those are a different way of relating to the same experience. So a bad trip doesn't really exist so much in many indigenous cultures. What you have is a challenging experience. And a challenging experience is where what's happening is you've taken some kind of medicine. Maybe it's LSD, maybe it's psilocybin, maybe it's ayahuasca, maybe it's iboga, whatever. And you are being brought something, something has been brought up for you to sit with. And you don't want to have it. You don't want to look at it. Like maybe you've suffered with depression throughout your life and you have taken this medicine and now what you're facing is the very thing that you avoided all your life. You're like, ah, I don't want to look at that. That's like that horrible experience I had. That's the darkness that I want to look at. Go away, go away, go away. It's your resistance to facing that thing that is causing the bad trip. That's what's leading to that. That's the experience that's happening. So really all there is, is there's a degree of suffering. And the suffering is because we are in resistance to what is showing up. Most of us, most of the time in our lives, there's stuff that we just don't want to face. Most of it's pretty unconscious. And so we stuff it down. And, and our, life, like, our life becomes about perpetually not having to face that stuff. It's not how it occurs to us, but that's what we're doing. So... You can find this out by just asking yourself, like, what annoys me? And it might be like people that make small talk and talk about bullshit or like people that are dishonest and phony. Great. So we can work with those. So people that are making a bunch of small talk, they're superficial, they're phony, and they're dishonest. That's what you can't be within yourself. That's what you can't be with. Get out of here. People trying to distract me. That's what you can't be with. And so you've tried to create this life where you don't have to be with your superficiality. The fact that every human has a degree of super, it is human to be superficial. It would be very weird if not, because our natural state is constantly in flux. And yeah, it's great to drop in deep sometimes, but sometimes we're nervous. And when we're nervous, it's like dogs tentatively sniffing each other's butts before they go right for the fellatio. At least that's what my dog does. He's like, all right, I've smelled your bum. Now it's time to give you the time of your life. So that's small talk. That's superficiality. We're nervous around each other and you don't have the capacity to accept that about yourself. And so whatever it is, the bad trip or the challenging experience, the challenging process would be a better term for it is where like that's being brought up and you're trying to resist it. And the whole point you take plant medicine is to heal that thing. And the only way to heal it is to have it come up. So bad trips typically happen when people don't have much of this context for what's happening. They don't have an understanding like, oh, this is being brought up to heal because they're relating to plant medicine the way I once did, which is I'm just going to take it and get ripped. I'm going to get high. Let's trip balls. And then the thing shows up to be healed and they're like, I don't want this. This isn't fun. I was just here to, to hang out and party. This sucks. So that's ultimately what a bad trip is. And when, when, there, when you hear this term, like there's ultimately no such thing as a bad trip, I mean, it's not true. If you hang out in the context that, bad, that there's like a bad trip, then there's a bad trip. But if the context you are coming from is one of like, I take this medicine to heal 
and there are challenging processes and there are less challenging processes, then, then inside that context, you don't really work with the idea of a bad trip. It's not really relevant. You're just like, oh, this is being brought up for me to heal and it's really dis it's uncomfortable. It's hard for me to be with it right now. That's what's going on. I'm having a hard time being with this. And if we can, if we have that context for it, then we can start to work with it. We can be like, okay, what do I need to do? Maybe I need to breathe a little bit so I can be with the discomfort a little bit more. Maybe I just need to like soften the, the space between my eyebrows. Maybe I need to soften my chest or my stomach. Maybe I need to remind myself I'm okay. Maybe I need someone to come and fan me. Like maybe I need someone who's trip sitting for me to just remind me that it's okay. See you, Jane. Thanks for hanging out. So that all becomes available inside the context of challenging process. Inside the context of challenging bad, of not challenging, inside the context of bad trip, you don't really have any options, right? It's just like, oh, that sucks. You got the shitty trip. You know, you were playing Russian roulette and you got the bullet in the chamber. Oh, well, hope this clears up for you. You know, so we want to come from that other context, that indigenous cultural context of the, of the, the cultures that have worked with this medicine for thousands of years and work with that because that's a much more empowering context than bad trip, shitty day for you. Distinguish between genuine harm and spiritual growth. These are these are tough like things to distinguish. I would say like any medicine can become poison. And and to some extent every poison becomes medicine because they're like two sides of the same coin. So we see this a lot in relationship. There's a, a guy who I can't remember his name, so I'll call him Jimmy Amago, but he's got like a better name. It's kind of it's was it Huxville Hendrix? Something like that? Hendrix Huxville? Anyhow, he created this idea of Imago therapy. And Imago, the idea is that you have an energetic shape. If you were abused a lot as a child, then your shape energetically will go seeking for that, what you had as a child. That's a wound in you, and you're going you're gonna to naturally end up with a partner who will fill, who will fill that role. So this is why people who tend to be abused naturally continue to find their way into relationships with abusers. It, it's also interesting because all of our attention is often on like punishing the abuser and that's going to miss the mark. I'm not saying they should get off with it. I'm not saying we shouldn't put attention there, but I'm saying if that's the only place we put our attention, we miss something. And what we miss is that the abused will seek out an abuser and will create people this way. That's what Imago does. That's, that's how we work. So in relationship, you're naturally going to find yourself in relationship with the person that's going to trigger your wound. They're going to re-trigger your wound. But the beautiful thing about this approach, this way of looking at relationship, is also that your partner has the medicine for you and you have the medicine for them. And so we come together and like the people that have learned to shut down themselves and dim their light are naturally going to find themselves into relationships with people that they judge to be narcissistic. We're going to come to that term in a sec. Monica has a great question about that. They're naturally going to find their way into those relationships. The reason being that those people they've judged as narcissistic will take up all the space and then that reinforces that they don't get to shine their light, which on the one hand, they're going to complain about, but on the other hand, it also lets them off the hook. They don't have to take up space. And so we have the medicine or the, the elixir inside of us to re-wound our partners, but also to heal them. So the same is true spiritually. Like any moment has the possibility of like genuinely spirit, like supporting you to grow spiritually and also to harm you. And often what makes the difference is the container in which you're held. Like in the forge, the program Bay and I run and, and which some of our viewers here are, uh, are members of, we, we like bring shit up. We ask the hard questions. We support you to see yourself in a very intimate light and to get very intimate with each other. And in the wrong kind of container, and you've probably been in these containers where the leader's like, this is the place where you can say anything. And you say anything, and it causes a big fucking mess. And then the leader's like, maybe don't say that. And you're like, this fucking bullshit. You said say anything. I said anything. I got in trouble for it. The end. So that's an example where the container's not able to, to hold that energy. It leaks out, and that's where genuine harm's caused. In the forge, just using it as an example, 
when, when that shows up, We've got enough training, enough of our own work, enough of our own support in our own life, and a leadership team that's trained enough that we can hold that energy so that it can be completed. Instead of just coming up and then sort of fizzling away and not ever getting completed, we can support you to bring that full circle so you can then release that. And that is spiritual growth. So they can look like it's kind of hard because what we as humans want is like, well, point to me the thing that is spiritual growth and point to the thing that's genuine harm. They're actually the same thing. But what makes the difference is like the container in which they're being held, the context in which you're working with them and the, like the, the strength and depth of practice of the people that are supporting you. So I'm not going to tell anyone not to experiment with drugs recreationally because I did that for the first two to three decades of my life. But there's going to come a point where you probably are like, hey, I actually want to like, I want to use this stuff with more reverence and I really want to use it to heal. And once you come to that point, I would really suggest working with people that can support you in that process as opposed to just trying to do it on your own. Because trying to do it on our own, it's going to run into our own blind spots. No plant medicine can, can like stop that. That's why at Rhythmia, when we're working down there, we have a huge team, a huge medicine staff to support people. And why I teach classes to help people understand how to integrate this work and what's happening and, and how to like see the work that they're looking past, that they're already, all of that sort of stuff. It's because just left to our own devices, we're likely to, to, to miss the mark. And so that's the gift that coaching is. That's the gift of this modern science we call coaching is that it, it means you don't have to do it all on your own. It means you don't have to figure this all out alone. The bad news is it means you no longer have an excuse to keep doing it on your own. Doing it on our own is way more comfortable because we don't have to be exposed to vulnerability. We don't have to let other people in. We don't have to let other people make a difference for ourselves. We can just say, nah, fuck it. I do my own work and I'm reliable and responsible and that's that. And that's cool, but you're probably missing the mark. So that's how I would distinguish those two. Cool question. Thanks a lot for that, Faison. Okay, what do we have from Monica? Oh, it disappeared. And Monica's was Sir Jersey. How do I get back to it? I go, I click, where's my live show? Hold on. I gotta bring it up here. I need to I need to reference my notes in this overbright. The live show disappear? Oh there it is. Boom. Yep. And then topic suggestions, click here. And then we click here. And we click there. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Monica is asking a really great question, kind of coming off the heels of what we were just talking about around narcissism, gaslighting, this sort of stuff. So she says, I have clients, friends, acquaintances that will say things like, he gaslighted me, or they're a narcissist, or I have imposter syndrome. These are three, these are all different terms but I'm often bothered by how all three are overused or often misused. Um, once I had someone say that their partner was gaslighting them because they accused the other of cheating on them. So like I accused my partner of cheating on me and they say I'm gaslighting them. That's, that's the example she's giving. To my understanding, this isn't actually what gaslighting means, but who am I to correct my client? And even should I? I currently address this by getting curious about why they're using the term and generally I just let the term fall by the wayside. I'm curious to know what you do when clients bring up these terms. In my personal life, it really pains me to be in a group of people all accusing a person who is not present of being a narcissist. I'm pretty sure none of these people are psychologists. Besides the obvious problem with gossiping, the issue for me is that people are using a very strong word, narcissist, to describe someone who acted selfishly. Can you share your thoughts? Such a good question. Thank you, Monica. Really appreciate you. Hey, Kayla. Nice to have you with us. So gaslighting, narcissism. What was the other one? Imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome, I'm going to move a little bit to the side because, uh, hey, Brandon, because gaslighting and narcissism are, are a little stronger and they're far more overused right now and, and I think a little more harmful. So the first, the first thing that's really important with this stuff is that these are, these are labels, obviously, right? But just saying that is not gonna convey the point I wanna make, because there's something really harmful with a label. What happens when I have a label is I put you in a box called you're a narcissist. Let's use a simpler example, and then we can come back to this. 
imagine I relate to you as a liar and a thief. And somehow, for some reason, you manage to get me to lend you $10. And so two months roll by, and you come back to me, and you go, hey, Adam, here's your 10 bucks back. So you've repaid my debt, your debt. You've repaid your debt to me. But I've got you in a box called liar and thief. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to go, well, okay, I got this 10 bucks, but where did Reggie get this money from? Who did he rip off to get this? Do I even want to accept this money at this point? And even if I don't do that and I set that all aside, it's far more likely that I'm going to do that given the box I've put you in. So the, the label, the judgment, the assessment that we put people into then dictates, it colors everything we witness them do from then onwards. And, and narcissism, gaslighting are super problematic for that reason because it, it creates a self-reinforcing pattern in how I relate to you. And what you could, like, you almost can't get out of that box once I've stuffed you in it. So that's the first problem, just with any kind of label. Um, I think, Monica, you hit the nail on the head. People use narcissistic or they're a narcissist when really what they mean is they, they, they acted selfishly. And what they're, what they're saying is he is selfish when in fact he just acted selfishly in that moment. And going even further, we don't even know what the motivation was. Maybe, maybe it wasn't that at all. Maybe it really wasn't a selfish motivation, but it just occurred that way to us. So I was doing some, some slides earlier today about the coaching manifesto, which you'll see me post from time to time if you follow my work. And the coaching manifesto is this beautiful scroll I send out to some people, special people. From 1 to 41 are listed the, the sort of principles, what we, what we espouse and follow as coaches, people leading coaching. And number one on the coaching manifesto is everyone is light find and see the light. So as soon as we label someone as narcissist, we, we, we can no longer see the light. Now what we are present to is the darkness they are. And so if we're practicing this first principle of the manifesto, we have work to do when someone does something that we judge. If someone does something that we find uh, selfish, we have, to, we have to really sit with it and we have to go, huh, what's the kind of light here? Like, what kind of person, what kind of beautiful qualities, qualities of being would show up this way? What might have someone showing up this way? So if I'm around someone and they're taking up all the space, I can ask myself questions like, huh, what kind of person would, sh would take up all the space in the room? Like from, not from a shitty judgmental place, but like what kind of beautiful quality might have a tendency to take up all the space in the room? Well, maybe, maybe someone who's a lot of radiance. Maybe someone with a lot of magnetism or presence might take up all the space in the room. Okay, all right, that would make sense. And what might be going on in the moment that would have presence take up all the space in the room? Like, why might that happen? What might be triggering that? Mm, well, maybe they're feeling unseen. Maybe they're feeling like afraid that they're irrelevant or they don't matter. And that's having them like clutch for more space. Look at me. So what we've just done there is we've gone from this behavior that's showing up in the moment back to the very light that they are and started to like look with charitability, started to look with compassion and benevolence at how they might arrive here from the light. And when we do that, it gives people, it gives us, first of all, way better way to relate to them. And they can actually, they don't have to get out of this shitty box called narcissist anymore. Instead, we're like, oh, all that's happening is I've got someone in front of me who is radiance and they're afraid. Oh, okay. And that, that gives them way more room, even if we don't say anything, even if we're just relating to them that way, it gives that person way more room to come back to the, to the light, to come back to the goodness. So that's, the, that's, I think, the biggest problem with these terms. The other problem with these terms is they completely abdicate, they let yourself totally off the hook from any kind of responsibility on your part. Oh, why did that person do that? Because they're a narcissist. The end. I don't need to look over on my side of the fence. Hey, who are you being in relationship to this person? How are you showing up? Are you taking up your space? Well, I would, except they're taking up all the space, so there's no room for me. Fuck you. That's, that's my non-coachy voice. Well, fuck you. Take some responsibility. How are you being? Well, I'm maybe keeping myself a bit small, but I wouldn't be doing... No, 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 stop. See you, Crystal. Thanks for hanging out. You're being small. And in transformational work, 
we always look there. We let go of diagnosing the other person. We let go of sort of saying, if only they would change then. Hey, Charlene, we let go of all of that. We, the reason we let go of it is, is because we recognize there's no transformation for us down that path. And so these terms are really toxic for us. They feel good, as most toxic things do. They, they feel kind of like, yeah, I'm like calling a spade a spade. I'm putting people in their place. Hell yeah. Body blow. DDT. I don't know. I started to become a wrestler there. Nonsense. They, they are toxic the same way gossiping and complaining are toxic. They let us feel kind of good in the short term while actually entrenching us in our, in our crystallized patterns. They stop us from being able to get beyond where we currently are and they hold us there. So we really want to do our best to stop playing with these terms, narcissistic, he's a narcissist, she's a narcissist, they're gaslighting me. And then let's talk about gaslighting. The problem with the term gaslighting is again, it lets you off the hook entirely. And it, and it kind of like, there's no winning in that. As soon as you label someone like you're gaslighting me, it's like, what can that person possibly do? The only option they're left with is to just like, you're right, I guess, the end. So it's a, it's a very toxic term because it kind of like, the, the irony of the term gaslighting is it, I'm hesitant to say this because it's like using it again, accusing someone of gaslighting gaslight someone it it because it's it's imposing it's like you supposing you know what they're thinking is it's you saying i understand how your internal workings are and from that understanding i'm clear that you're doing this so as to manipulate me that that that's such a mind fuck and it doesn't really work daniel i see your post uh, your comment and i'm going to come back to it um so that's the that's one of the problems with gaslighting. The second problem is that the more we show up a particular way in the world, the more we're attuned to look for that. As an example, when I was a lawyer, what I did constantly was find the conflict and figure out how to win inside of the conflict. And so guess what I saw a lot of in the world? Conflict, constantly, everywhere I looked, and I created a lot of conflict. So the other irony about the more you use the term gaslighting, I can give, I would bet good, good money that you're gaslighting people. The people that complain the most about gaslighting tend to be the ones that do the most gaslighting. They're going to argue with that. They're going to say, I'm gaslighting them. That's fine. That's their prerogative. I'm not interested in like changing their mind because only they can change their mind. But the thing I want to invite you to consider is that the more you accuse people of doing something, the more that that is an indication that there is something for you to look at about who you're being. And the, the way you can kind of find the truth in that, sort of the hint, is that as soon as I say something like that, you might be like, hell no, fuck that. I hate gasoline. I would never do that. And what that is, is your resistance to considering the, the proposition I'm putting in front of you. It's like, I'll give you a simple example. I was doing some assessing for master certified coaching. I was sort of helping a, a friend of mine do some work. And at the end, I was saying, you know, it was interesting. This person kept saying how they weren't afraid, but what I was present to was real fear. And when they finished their debrief, this, the person said, ah, I didn't feel fear at all. I think fear is weak. So they've got a story that fear is bad and wrong, and there's no way they would be that way. That's the hint. That's the indication. That's a place where they're unwilling to even consider that possibility. And anytime there's a place where we're unwilling to even consider a possibility, that's a blind spot. It's a place we're not free. So I would invite you to take a look down that path if you're the sort of person that points that finger a lot. It can be really, really caustic for you. Uh, Daniel says, I was a codependent trauma survivor. Narcissists tend not to, do, tend not to want to do the work. That's fine, Daniel. And, and like, if this person was actually diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, then, hey, Jason, then that's, that's what it is. But I'm not saying narcissists need to do their work. I'm saying as soon as we point the finger at a narcissist and say they're doing blah, 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 it lets us off the hook of doing our work. And that's, that's what this is all about, is what can draw us more into our work. And we use, when we use terms like that, we let ourselves off. It wasn't your fault, Adam. That was just a narcissist. And, and this is not about um, 
this is not about like victim shaming or victim harming or kind of like putting ourselves in the situation where we're like, I should be responsible for all the horrible abuse that they heaped on me. It's important that we recognize that, but the amount of times people actually encounter someone with NPD relative to the amount of times that term is thrown around is vastly out of proportion. And it's that that we're talking about here. And let's see what you wrote here about gaslighting. Do your work. We've got five bars. We're all good, Facebook. Daniel writes, my understanding of gaslighting is when someone makes blanket statements on my behalf without giving me an opportunity to respond or rebut. So sure, we could use that as the definition. But again, the, the inquiry I want to invite is who am I being that is having that happen? And, and what people do is, is not that. Instead, they accuse of gaslighting, they end up in a new relationship, they accuse of gaslighting, they end up in a new relationship, they accuse of gaslighting, and, and, and they're like, that's me doing the work, I'm calling out what's there, I'm, I'm bringing courage. Okay, if that's where you are in your process, that's fine. But if you want to move beyond that, the thing to do is to start asking, like, how am I showing up that's enabling this? This is the funny thing, when people end up in a relationship with someone that doesn't honor their boundaries, well, guess what? You're not actually holding your boundaries sovereign. Because if you are a sovereign and you hold your boundaries, what you will discover is that people that dishonor your boundaries tend to move away because you either walk away from those relationships yourself or because you just become very uninteresting or because other people start to learn about boundaries from the way you hold them and start to, to do the same thing for themselves. So this is what I found. I see a lot of posting on like social media where people are like, Here's how to like deal with people that don't honor your boundaries. Here's how to like put people in their place when they don't honor your boundaries, like a lot of that sort of stuff. Here's how to spot blah, 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 blah. I find that's all a distraction because what all of that work does is it looks over there at them. Instead, what I find really powerful is get clear on your boundaries and then stand for them. And if you do that, all of that other work falls away. I don't have to do that because I become incredibly uninteresting to people that tranche over my boundaries because they get pretty quickly put into their place and they're like, ah, okay, got it. This guy sucks. I'm not interested in him. And I'm like, yeah, boundaries are awesome. It's cool. I like them. So that, that's where I get to. I'm going to come back to your, what you wrote there, Daniel, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read what everyone's written here. So Jay says, inability to be with the reflection of ourselves we see in others, that's relatable. Yes. And just says, the day I brought back to me was the day I brought this back to me was the day I set myself free, not met another one since. So beautiful. What Angela's referring to is like the day she brought back, sort of owning her truth, owning her boundaries, really standing in them. That's the day we get set free. Manon says, your shares and perspectives are so clear. Wow, thank you. Thanks, Manon. It's nice to see you. What did you write, Rachel? See more. Rachel says, to me, the issue is saying you. What's use useful is acknowledging I feel X, which is vulnerable and responsible. The other person gets to use that feedback or not. If they're interested in mutuality, they will be interested in the feedback and service of the relationship. Yeah. Yeah, this is part, another part of the issue with gaslighting is that I'm ironically doing the very thing I'm accusing you of. And I, I'm, I'm sort of telling you what you're doing, which is what the complaint about gaslighting is. And we can, we can shortcut a lot of this when we are willing to sort of, instead of saying like, you're doing this to me and I don't like it. Like you're being manipulative and I don't like that. That doesn't work. What I can say instead is I, I, feel, I feel like I'm being pushed in a direction. You know, the more I can bring it back to my heart and my own experience and the more I can separate that from, from anything I'm putting on you, the easier it becomes to start to move and work in relationships. Bay and I have done a lot of work in this art because both of us didn't have good models for this growing up. And so um, my parents were very loving. I just didn't see a lot of this. A lot of it happened behind closed doors or whatever. So I just didn't have, I didn't get to see this in action. And so when we can say like, I'm feeling hurt in this moment, what we're doing is we're letting the other person off the hook. I'm not saying I'm feeling hurt because of what you're doing. I'm just saying I'm feeling hurt in this moment. And that actually provides the other person a great deal of grace. And those instances, the other person can be like, they can take that on or not. They can work with it or not, but it actually takes them, it lets them off the hook. And when you let people off the hook this way, it's easier for them to come back to relationship with you. Gaslighting 
destroys that possibility because it, it focused on what they're doing. <laughs> hey, Maria, nice to see you. And uh, Charlene's saying you make things so clear. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. I appreciate that reflection. And Daniel, you're saying, going back to what you said, Adam, about failing to self-reflect, I am constantly self-evaluating, and that's why I can spot my dysfunctions in others. Cool, man. Keep it up. Uh, Daniel also writes, where do you draw the line between mental laziness and mental efficiency? Uh, I think I would need more context to be able to answer that because there's, it's so broad, you know, like if you can give me an example of a situation like that or, or something along those lines, that would help. Jane writes, my sense has been that these terms, for example, gaslighting, are so overused that there is a collective contribution to ossifying such a narrowing of the field of meaning of that state. Jane, number one, I love that you used ossifying. Great word. I love that. For everyone that's not familiar, ossifying is sort of a metaphoric term. It can mean many things, but it's a metaphoric term for how as we age, we tend to become more brittle in our thinking. We become more rigid in our ability to accept work with new eyes. We, we become rigid and frozen and tight. And so um, Jane's saying, you know, the more we use these terms and they get overused, we narrow kind of their, their perspective and what they can allow. Um, I really think I'm, I'm sitting with this. So bear with me. I'm kind of distinguishing this in the moment up here on the hill, on the mount. But I, I have a belief that I don't know that a term like gaslighting is ever actually helpful. Um, maybe I should, I should qualify that in the transformational realm. So in the healing from trauma realm, that term might actually be necessary. It might be really helpful, but in the, in the transformational realm where we're, we're taking responsibility here, we're taking back our power. We are whole and complete. We are not trying to work with a gaping wound left from trauma in that realm where we are seeking to create transformation and possibility, I think that there's no place, I don't think gaslighting really has a role. Now, that's, that's a thought in the moment, that's a hot take. So if, if you have like a, a differing thought, by all means, please offer it. Um, but as I'm sitting with this sort of stuff, I'm like, I don't know that that's a very helpful term because on some level it removes responsibility from me, so. Cool, lively discussion, I love it, guys. Uh, do, 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 do. Monica, thank you so much for bringing us that, that topic. That was really juicy. I got a final one. Oh, I love what Rachel wrote. I find it useful to see when I gaslight myself, meaning I'm invalidating my own experience or feelings. That, yes, well said, Rachel. That, so that is a place, that's probably the best place where we can use that term, where we, um, that, that's really helpful. So we can start to see like, oh, I have a desire and I'm actively telling myself why that desire is no good. Like why I should just not feel that way. That that's a super like that right there is the heart of the, there's so much magic in that because that's where we can find like in my in my um speaking I would call that where we're we're irreverent towards ourselves. We're not holding ourselves with sacredness. It's really a lovely Rachel. Thanks for putting that in. And Daniel wrote, lazy versus efficiency. When setting boundaries, where do you distinguish when we're just ducking uncomfortable conversations or just avoiding conflict? Ah, uh -huh, I see. Well, I don't think, like, I think boundaries can be, so I, boundaries are often best served when they're simple, I think, first of all, as opposed to, like, complicated. And so, like, a simple boundary is, like, I'm not okay with people screaming at me. That, that makes it really simple. And like, I'm up for an uncomfortable conversation, but I'm not interested in someone screaming at me. And you could be like, well, Adam, you're just like ducking, learning how to be okay with people screaming at you. Well, the premise of my boundary is that I'm actually not interested in becoming okay with people screaming at me. This would be like a distinction between transformational work and Scientology. Scientology would be like, like the kind of, in, in a way, like, train you to be okay with abuse like you're going to sit here and this person's going to scream at you and say horrible things about you and you are going to learn how to just sit still in the face of that yeah that's not healthy 
I'm not interested in learning how to be okay with that. And, and that's a decision I make. And, and with a boundary, we kind of have to just choose something. Like, I, I really get that impulse. Like, ah, but how do I know that I'm not like letting myself off the hook? Kind of got to trust ourselves. And that's why I like to make boundaries that are simple for me. There is, there is, as a general rule, I'm not interested in being in conversations where people are screaming at me, full stop. So you, you're welcome to say like you're ducking that and I'll be like, yeah, probably not. And it's kind of, I've got a secret to make this a little easier, which is that woman called Rachel Fink Parks writing these comments, she's my coach. And so she can help me see these situations where I'm like, where I'm trying to create a boundary that maybe there's some slipperiness, at least for people like me, who didn't really learn so much about boundaries as a kid and had to like learn them in his late 30s. For the most part, it's probably not that I'm ducking something with boundaries. Like I'm more likely to set aside my boundary to try to be more responsible than I am to actually honor a boundary. So the work for me almost always is towards that, that reverse bias. Like the direction I'm less likely to go is to set a boundary and just be clean with it. And so that's where I tend to practice more. Yeah. Yeah. It's better that way. Okay. We got one more guys. Thanks for the comments, the, the chat, the, the it's super lively. It's really fun to be up here on this Hill with you. So, uh, Someone shared this, uh, and it's a really great one. I really love it. It's a little older. They say, you know, I've got a partner that's very magnetic, attractive, draws a lot of attention. And at times there are people that like, that are drawn towards them. And when they're drawn towards them, they tend to be inappropriate. They tend to make comments behind my back. They tend to like do things like hit on them. And I know some, for, I know for a fact, some of these people have cheated like cheated on, on their partner or cheated with other people that they've done this with. So there's like a history, you know, of sort of not the best, um, not the best uh, integrity around this sort of stuff. And so this person's asking, you know, like everything I want to do would likely end the relationship with them and probably ruin a good friendship. And um, this person also feels sneaky enough that if I call them out, they'll just deny their intentions, even though they're plain as day. A similar situation has happened in the past, and what I did was destroy the friend group, permanently isolated them, which worked, and, and that I got to remove that, but I kind of feel guilty for the whole thing. So great, great topic. Um, Manon, I'm going to come to your question in a sec. Um, so in, a, in situations like this, the best place I find to go, again, is back within, as Rachel was sharing with us, like to look at how am I feeling, as opposed to I know what this person's intentions are. Anytime we get into, I know what this person's intentions are, it's a bit tricky because we can't, we cannot. We can have evidence for what their intentions have been in the past. We can see all that. And I'm not saying that that, that may not be their intentions at this moment in time and in the future. What I'm saying is that we really want to come to like the starkness of the fact that we cannot know someone's intentions, period. But what we can know with absolute certainty is how we feel. We can be the arbiter of that. <clears throat> and so in situations like this where it's like, man, every time we hang out with these people, <clears throat> I feel insecure. I feel like that they're being inappropriate with you, my love. And I feel like I, I feel afraid and scared and I don't feel good. When we share something with that lens, it gives our partner so much more space to be with us. And it's so much more vulnerable and honest because we are just sharing our truth. And for the most part, from sharing that way, it, it opens the conversation so our partners can kind of like receive us. And some partners will be like, just get over yourself. You're, not, you're making it all up. It's nonsense. And that can be tough. And that's not the most loving place for our partners to come from. But... That's, that's their prerogative, right? And, and that might tell us something about our partner. Like, wow, my partner is kind of callous and cold, not really interested in how I feel. Sometimes th there's a negotiation that happens with this stuff that can be tricky. Like sometimes Bay will share stuff with me and, um, and I'm like, okay, thanks for sharing. Like, thanks for showing me your heart. Thanks for sharing that. I'm going to take the look at that. Sometimes she'll share something and I'll bring it to my coach and sometimes she'll share something and I'll be like, I'm really clear. That's not like I, 
what what is true for me is that that's made up and and that's going to be the case sometimes and so my job in those situations is a tricky one it's the negotiation i'm talking about where i have to get comfortable on this rock first of all there success did that i have to honor my truth and honor my partner and so in those situations where i'm like that's not how it occurs for me like the, as i learn to create better art with this the way that it kind of comes across is i'll be like my love thank you for sharing that with me that's not how it occurs for me here's how it occurs for me this is what i'm experiencing this is what i see and and like and then see what happens from there. That's the negotiation part, right? We can't know how that's going to go. But but then, Adam, what do you say next? I don't know, because I'm going to see what she says. But like, there's there's a trickiness to this. I'm finding, especially being the masculine energy in my relationship, or the times when my job is to hold the masculine pole, is to like really know where my feet stand and to stand in my feet. And there's and and like that's going to be a tough situation sometimes. And um. And, and we work with that together. We, we grow with that together and, and find our, our collective truth. How are we going to approach this? So there are times when, when you might, any of us might bring to our partner like, hey, here's how this feels. I feel really jealous. I feel really blah, blah, blah. And like, okay, I'm going to really take a look. And like, uh, I didn't notice that. And there's been times where Bayes brought stuff like this to me. And like, I was completely oblivious to it. Like, I... Um, I grew up with a story that I was an unattractive nerd. I was an ugly nerd that women wanted nothing to do with. And that story like was persistent forever. And what it created was I was really, really oblivious to women hitting on me, which it turns out happens fairly often these days, especially as I like do more of my healing and, and like unlock more of my sexuality as a man and like come more and more into my own magnetism. Like there's a lot of that. Women like are drawn to a, to a, a whole and complete man who's clean in himself. That's attractive. So it happens more often. And there's this period where like, I was totally clueless to it and it would cause problems because they would be like, I feel like what's happening is in the program. I'd be like, it's not, I'm right. And the hard thing about that is that in that moment, my truth was my truth. And I could have just been like, you're right, I'll just set this aside, but that wasn't gonna work. I kinda, the only way I could discover this was to be blindsided by it. And that's not like, we don't like that, right? That's where we wanna know, like, what's the answer? You know, but how do I, what if my fiance tells me I have nothing to worry about and they keep spending time with this? And it's sort of like, where we have to come to is like, do you trust your partner? Like, do you trust your fiance? Do you trust your relationship? Do you trust yourself? Never mind about this other person. And, and like, maybe the way that we have to discover this for ourselves is by, like, going through it. Because that's the only way we can create, one of my teachers often says this, the only way we can create wisdom is through experience. And what we want is everyone to get that wisdom just because we told them. No, 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 this person's doing this thing. You should see this, like create that wisdom. But the only way they can get it sometimes is being blindsided. And that's really hard. That really requires a lot of courage. So for situations like this, we can share our truth and we can continue to share our truth. And then, and then where we're left at the end of the day is we have to trust our partner and, and we have to trust ourselves and we have to trust our relationship. And that is really edgy because if you trust someone, you are putting yourself at risk. To trust is to expose yourself. Otherwise, there is no trust required. It's a really great topic. Thank you for bringing that, my anonymous benefactor. Manon, you write, I'm curious about your coaching manifesto. I understand that you share it, but I don't want to impose. How can I access it? What do you mean by access it? Like, are you wanting to order a scroll or are you just wanting to like download the, the text? I can, I can share with you either of those. The scroll, I can... Uh, it costs a little bit, but I can absolutely have one printed to you and sent. I've just finished doing some videos. I don't know if anyone's seen the scroll that we create. It's, 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 um, it's a gift that we send to certain people. It's a really beautiful, uh, like proper scroll with like rollers, walnut rollers that you can open out and like dirt, you could come into a room and be like, dirt, da, da, da. coaching manifesto 16. And then you could say stuff like that. It'd be kind of cool. 
But if you just want to download, I'm happy to, to send it to you, Manal. Just uh, send me a message or an email, and if there's a different way that you want it, you can let me know about that too. Okay, let's straighten her back. Let's take a moment for me to check in and see if there's any other topics. And please, you also check in and see if there's any other topics. I would love if you've got anything left for us to riff on today before we wind down. I would love to hear about it. And I'm going to just do a quick check in myself. Hmm. There is one thing that is present in mind, and that's the the, the, what I call staying in the conversation. So I often have a lot of people in converse, varying levels of conversation with me where they want to work with me. And what tends to happen is people get to the point where they're like, I'm going to work with you someday. Or uh, things are crazy right now. I just need to get them handled and then we'll work together. And um, and that's totally fine, first of all. So none of this is like a, a, they're doing something wrong. But what I want to share is what I notice is the number one thing that has people end up working with me. Like what has people, what's the difference between the people that end up in this kind of relationship and then having their lives shift? Because I assert that's what happens. And you can talk to my clients if you're unsure, let ask them and they'll tell you like this shit works. It's amazing. So. The number one thing that has people get into this kind of work and then continue with it as opposed to get excited about it and then fall away and, and rarely come back is this. It's that they stay in the conversation. And staying in the conversation means, hey, I really want to do this, but shit's fucking crazy right now. And I don't know how. Can we have a conversation about that? Hey, I really want to do this but I'm like nervous about money and I can't figure out how to make this work. Can we have a conversation about that? And what's happening, the reason these people end up getting, going through the fire and getting into this and then creating the results commensurate with coaching is because they are being a demand for coaching before we've even created an agreement together. They're asking for that support. And so who they are being before we've even started working together is they are being a client. And they're making use of coaching from that perspective. And this is, this is how everything works in life. It's not what we think is sort of like, there's something I really, really want. And once I'm there, I can be a certain way. And so I've got to figure out like what I need to do to get there. And then I can be this way. And, and the reason I'm speaking to this is not, it's not really about like, you should have more conversations with me. Don't do that. I don't have time for that. <laughs> it's not about you should become my client. That'd be cool, but that's not what it's about either. It's as an example of how the transformation actually works, which is you start along a path and there's a way of being that that path will take you to. And rather than wait until you get there to start being that, you choose into that way of being right now and you start acting that way. And so it's gotten to the point where I can tell very quickly who is going to like begin to go down this path with me and start to create the transformation they're craving because they're the people that start to engage that way of being early on. So really take note of that. Like whatever it is your goal is, ask yourself, who would I be being upon achieving this? And then come back to what is there for me to start doing now that would be aligned with that way of being? What would I engage with more in? What would I take on more of? What would I say yes to more of? Where would I step over the precipice down into what's scary more often? And if you do that, your life will start to shift. That's the hidden secret behind all of this is start being that way now. I know it's not easy. I'm not saying it's simple or lacking in fear. Of course, all those things are present, but that's the number one thing. That's the number one thing that I see responsible for people's success. Okay, looks like we got no mao uh, topics. I'm gonna hike back down this hill I'm going to have a conversation with someone. I'm going to get on my one wheel and I'm going to ride and it's going to be dope. And then, uh, and then I'm probably going to play some video games tonight because Baldur's Gate 3, I'm going to talk to you about Baldur's Gate 3. That's what we're going to do here. Baldur's Gate 3 just came out for the Mac today, hopefully. They keep delaying it. Baldur's Gate, for anyone that watched the Dungeons and Dragons movie, if you haven't watched it, you should. It's pretty funny. It's kind of good. Good cast. Chris Pine, Hugh Grant, delightful. Baldur's Gate was... One of the early 
really, 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 really good role-playing games available on the computer back in the day. Historically, there's been console, like Nintendo, Sega, TurboGrafx-16, whatever, and PC, Windows primarily. And the console had a lot of really good role-playing games, and computers had some. And Baldur's Gate was like the top of the line. Baldur's Gate 2, amazing game. And that came out like 20 years ago. And since then, there's this company based out of Quebec, Montréal, where Manon habite, and um, they're called Larian, and they make exquisite games, and they bought the rights to do this, and they've been working on this, and to their credit, they've said, look, we're not going to grind, we're not going to push our developers to put something out early, we're going to release the game when it's ready to be released. And so a month ago, they put it out on Windows, and then those of us on Macs have been like, when's our game coming? Usually you don't even get any games on Mac, but this time they're like, we're going to put it on Mac, and they just quietly delayed it, and delayed it, and delayed it. And yesterday they were going to put it out, and they're like, ah, we've got to wait one more day. So hopefully today is the day, and then I'm going to become a hermit. I'm not going to talk to anyone. I'm just going to play glorious video games for like the next seven years of my life, slash two days before I get bored and start doing something else. So that's the plan for this weekend. I hope you all have an amazing weekend. I hope your weather looks as good as this. I hope you have less smoke than this up in your city. And uh, thanks for hanging out. Love you all. Peace.